Today we're going to start going through the different invertebrate phyla and talking about what makes each one unique and how each one is a little more advanced than the one before. So we're going to start with our very first one, which is the sponges, and they belong to the phylum that's called periphera. Now periphera, the meaning of the name is pore bearing, as in pores not uh, being poor, but having holes, pore bearing. And they are actually the simplest of all the animals. And the reason why we consider them the simplest is because, number one, they don't actually have true tissues. Like, they don't have muscle. They don't have nervous uh, tissue. They also don't have any kind of body symmetry. That's called being asymmetrical, when you don't have any kind of body symmetry. And that is unique to the sponges. They are found only in water, mostly salt water, but there are a few freshwater sponges. And there are a few body parts that they have that are important. Um, the first one is what are called choanocytes. These, choanocyto means cell. Uh, and the choanocytes, they're also sometimes called collar cells. This is their other name. It's kind of an easier name to remember. And the reason why they're called that is because they look like this, like they have a little collar. And then they have a little flagellum that comes out. This has a nucleus inside of it. Looks like an organism the way I drew it. This is actually a cell. And what these do is they line the inside of the sponge. So if you imagine this is a sponge, it's pretty sloppy, and this is the big hole in the middle. And lining this inside are these collar cells, these choanocytes. And what they do is they stir up the water um, and filter, filter it. So the water all gets sucked in by the flagella waving on these choanocytes. And as the water comes in and it goes out here, they can actually, they're filter feeders, they can actually filter out little plankton and things like that out of the water, and that becomes their food. So a uh, checkpoint question, why are they considered the earliest? Well, because we think that they're like the most simple of the animals, that they, they developed first, and then later in evolution came the development of complex tissues, like nervous tissue and uh, bone and uh, muscle and all of those things. They don't have a stomach. They don't have a mouth. They don't have a brain. They don't have eyes. They're very, very simple. Um, and when we get to our next group, you're going to see that there's already some advancement there. So uh, going through the parts of the sponge, so they have a big hole in the middle. It's actually called the osculum. Oopsies. And, um, and that hole is where the water exits. But the water comes in through the pores. Now what causes that water to be sucked in are these these choanocytes, see how they have like a little collar around them and they have a flagellum. And that flagellum, beating the flagella, causes the water to get sucked in and then it all comes out through the top. Now, a couple of other types of cells you should know in the sponge. They have a cell called an amoebocyte. You can see why. We just talked about amoeba. Amoebocytes are for digestion. They actually digest the food particles that the sponge brings in. And then they also have these skeletal fibers. These are actually, they have a name. They're called spicules. Now, some sponges have lots of spicules. They can be made of calcium uh, carbonate. They can also be made of uh, silica, like glass. Um, but uh, bath sponges, natural bath sponges, typically don't have those. They have more of this spongy protein called spongin. Otherwise, they would scratch your skin when you used them. Here's a little video I just want to show you. You can actually see the motion of the water coming in. Sponges are very effective filter feeders since they're able to capture and eat particles as small as bacteria, as well as larger particles. They might not look like they're doing much, but a simple demonstration shows how effectively sponges can pump water. On a reef in the Caribbean, I make a dive with a syringe filled with a non-toxic dye called fluorescein. By squirting it around the base of some sponges, we can observe how the water is moving by watching what the dye does. Within only seconds, the dye is pumped through the sponges along with the water. As you can see, a sponge is a pretty good water pump and also a good strainer. Any plankton that goes in with the water won't come back out through the osculum. All right. So that kind of gives you an idea of the, the sponge, how they, how they filter feed. So they're actually pretty cool uh, considering how simple they are. They get the job done. They get their food. They can reproduce. They don't move. Most animals can move. Now their babies can, 
from what I understand, their babies swim and then like locate somewhere and grow into the adult. All right, our second group, now we're going to start to see some advancement, are what are called cnidarians. So it looks like cnidarian, but the C is actually silent. And the meaning of the name cnidaria, it means stinging. So they're named after the fact that they actually have these cells called cnidocytes. Site, again, means cell, and this nido has to do with stinging. And so they, have, they all have stinging cells on them. Um, so they have radial symmetry. Remember, radial means they have a top and a bottom, but they don't have a, like a left and a right. You can sort of cut them in any direction, and you get two equal sides. They do have two tissue layers in the developing embryo. Uh, one is called the ectoderm, and that uh, actually forms the, um, the outer epidermis, and it also ends up forming the nervous system, a little bit of a nerve net that they use. And then they have a second layer called the endoderm. And then in between that, they have a jelly-like layer. Um, they also have what's called a gastrovascular cavity. So vascular because it, it's, um, it, it, water goes in there, and gastro has to do with the stomach. So this is actually how they digest their food. So um, they have two body forms. One's called the polyp. A polyp is one that grows upward like this. So this would include... Hydras, which you may not be familiar with, they're freshwater, uh, but also coral and sea anemones. So coral is like this hard calcium carbonate um, skeleton, and then inside all the little holes of the coral are these individual polyps. And then the medusa form is like the jellyfish, and these are the ones that can swim around freely. So what does this gastrovascular cavity do? This gastrovascular cavity is like what's in the middle here. Well, particularly on the ones that move, one of the things it does is it actually helps them with movement. It's like a, almost like a little skeleton, and as they pump this cavity, they can actually move through the water. The other thing it does is it's lined with the cells um, that are going to help them with digestion. So they're going to capture their food and sting it, and then they're going to digest it in that gastrovascular cavity. But they don't actually have like a stomach and intestines. Uh, and all of that inside of them, they're, they're much simpler. So this is the polyp form, the sea anemone, or this is a hydra. I actually had a bunch of these in my fish tank at home. Um, they're very tiny. Sea anemones are bigger. And then this is a jellyfish. Uh, a man of war is another example. It's actually a colonial organism where a whole bunch of them live together, and they can have tentacles something like 30 feet long, and then they make this big gas bubble on top of them. Now, what makes them sting are these. These are called nidocytes. So cnidarian, stinger, nidocyte is a stinging cell. And these stinging cells, so this is like one little teeny part of a tentacle, and these are the stinging cells, the nidocytes. And they have this little, this little spike. And when that spike gets tripped, like something brushes against it, it causes this, this uh, tentacle called a nematocyst to shoot out and, and this is covered in poison, and it, it will uh, paralyze the prey. So if anybody's ever been stung by a jellyfish, um, what's actually happening is one tentacle is not stinging you one time. It's these thousands of cells just lining this tentacle, and they all sting you. Um, and some can be very, very dangerous. And what do you do if you get stung? Um, it is not true that you should pee on it. Just FYI, that is not probably going to do anything. Um, what actually will work is vinegar. Because if you remember all the way back when we talked about enzymes, enzymes can be denatured by changing the pH, and the acidity of the vinegar will actually neutralize the toxin, the enzymes in the toxin. Also, they talk about putting a warm compress on it. Apparently, the warmth will also stop it. You don't want to put cold water on it. You definitely don't want to pee on it. Um, but that will help. This jellyfish have jellyfish. no head, no skeleton, and no specialized organ systems, yet they have managed to survive for about 650 million years. They are interesting creatures and have been the subject of much scientific study. Jellyfish are cnidarians, as are coral and sea anemones. But coral and anemones are polyps. They attach to a solid surface with their mouths and tentacles face up. While the life cycle of some jellyfish includes a polyp stage, these animals eventually float free and become medusae, umbrella-shaped creatures with mouths and tentacles that face down. 
Most jellyfish float with the ocean currents, but they can swim by expanding and contracting their bodies, pushing water out around them. This process is similar to the way in which jet engines propel an aircraft. Jellyfish can look harmless, even beautiful, in their underwater homes. But look out! These animals are hunters. Jellyfish may not be able to chase down their prey, but they make up for it with a powerful weapon. The tips of the jellyfish's tentacles are covered with long, stinging cells. Jellyfish use their stingers to inject their prey with a paralyzing venom. Jellyfish's stinging cells can also be used to discourage predators. Alright, so that kind of gives you, we're actually going to stop with that, that kind of gives you an idea, all those little stingers shooting out. In fact, if you get a jellyfish tentacle on you and you wipe the area, you know, you wipe your hand across it to like try to get it off, you're actually going to trip more of those spikes um, and cause more of those nematocysts, those stingers to come shooting out and, uh, and actually inject more venom into you. So it's kind of, kind of a scary thing to come in contact with jellyfish. Alright, so we're going to stop with that. Tomorrow we're going to pick up and talk about worms.